Monday. Monday after a holiday for us in the U.S. So that can mean a rough Monday for some people, but I don't have a normal life, so it's all the same to me. <laughs> How's it going, you guys? Um, I'm going to still keep kind of getting set up here while people arrive. So feel free to talk in the chat, say hi. Um, hey, Mr. Al, how's it going? Um, I'm gonna be trying to take questions as much as I can. Um, I don't have a really intense practice schedule for today. I just thought I would practice, take some questions, hang out with you guys, the usual. So if you don't mind, there's my other stream. I'm gonna do a couple more little things and then um, we'll get going. My cello was really out of tune this morning, so that already needed some attention. And let me know how the volume levels are. Um, I know my voice is a lot more quiet than the cello, so I'm gonna try to adjust for when I'm playing. Um, but if there's any issues with the audio, be sure to let me know so I can change it on my end if I need to. put out a little tweet. Okay, hello everybody who is just arriving and who missed my initial hello. Happy Monday. Gonna be doing some practicing and also taking any of your questions. Um, if you guys didn't see, um, I did a video recently about some advice that I got in high school, which caused a lot of controversy, which was fun and exciting um, because some people agreed with the advice that I got. I did not agree with the advice that I got. Everybody had all sorts of opinions. Um, so since I just did that video recently, I thought I would also just kind of open myself up to questions that people have, um, you know, with those kinds of topics in terms of like career building and getting started with a music career um, or music school, anything like that. But I was also just going to do some practicing and some hanging out, all that good stuff. All right. Hey, everybody in the chat. Thanks for joining. Gonna get this tweet posted and then we will get rolling. Okay. I have been playing cello, let's see. It's been a while now, um, but I didn't start cello how a lot of professionals start. A lot of professionals start cello um, by taking private lessons. So they start learning right away and progressing. Um, I started playing the cello in my public school district, so I didn't have one-on-one -on -one instruction. I was just kind of playing an orchestra and learning a little bit at a time. So that was in fourth grade, so I was about eight or nine. So if we count from fourth grade when I started in orchestra, I've been playing cello about 20 years. Um, but I wasn't really that serious about it. It was like something I did at school once a week, um, and it wasn't until I was about 15 and I was in high school that I started taking private lessons, and then I got really serious. So I kind of start counting from usually around 15, uh, which would put me more at like 12, 13 years of playing cello. But either way, I've been playing cello a long time at this point. Okay. I'm gonna do a few other things and then start playing. Um, okay. Let's see, Michelle has a question about practicing. Let's see, I'm trying to decide which computer. I've got like a bunch of computers set up here. Maybe I will read questions from my other computer. Um, oh, your first year as a music major. That's an intense year for sure. Um, so much to practice. How should I practice and how hard orchestra music and solo? Okay, big question. Um, well, for one, if you're not a planner, 
Um, you should definitely block out certain amounts of time. Like, don't just get into the practice room and kind of try to do whatever until you burn out because it's just, it's too hard. If you have a lot of stuff to do, it's really helpful to say, okay, I'm going to spend an hour on solo music, an hour on orchestral excerpts in the morning, and then I'll have a lunch break, I'll go to class, and then in the evening I'll do another hour on this, another hour on that. So I would definitely advise just scheduling the time for one because then you can also give yourself a break. Like, even if you don't feel good after you've practiced an hour, you can know, okay, at least I put an hour in on my excerpts or whatever. Um, I know for me, I would usually try to practice the things I don't want to practice very much first when I had the most energy um, and the most motivation, and then I would reward myself by practicing the more fun stuff. So you'd have to decide what that is for you, if it's your solo rep or whatever. Like for me, I hated orchestral excerpts. Like that was like my nightmare. So I tried to make myself practice those first, get that done, feel okay about it, and then move into my solo repertoire, and then I could go as long as I wanted on my solo rep. Um, so definitely organize the time, block it out, try doing your least fun things first so you know those get done. If you get too tired and you can't do it. I mean, how much to practice is really a personal decision. I think when I was a freshman and I was practicing really hard, I was aiming for, I tried to do three hours a day in music school minimum. Um, and that's really going to depend on your course load and how things go from day to day. Um, but when you're really working hard and you're trying to progress, three hours a day, if you're smart about it, is a good amount. You don't have to do more than that. Um, and you may not be able to fit those three hours every single day, but practice smart. You know, do your scales and your warm-ups and then go right into the hard passages. Don't waste your time playing through the stuff you can already play, because if you don't have a lot of time and you're tired, just go right to the hard stuff. It's not always fun, but it'll make your time more efficient, so you don't have to spend five hours in the practice room necessarily. Um, so try it out. I think getting organized is the best way to start. And then you can try things and see, oh, this day was really productive because this. I know I used to have like my Saturday morning routine in college where I would like get up, have a huge coffee, big breakfast, and then bam, in the practice room as long as I could last with all my food and caffeine. So you'll find your own rhythm. Um, but being organized, I think, is the most helpful thing. Um, hey, everybody. Oh, I'm so glad you guys have lots of questions. This is great. Um, Eliminating tension in difficult passages. So I would say, um, you know, tension a lot of times will come when we're playing things up to tempo, oftentimes faster passages. So the first kind of basic thing to do is just go under tempo, go however slow, even if it seems ridiculous, whatever tempo it needs to be to relax the muscles, to feel like you're not clenching. Go to that tempo, even if it's half speed or quarter speed, whatever. Start slow. And then you have to work yourself up kind of gradually trying to keep, you know, the tension down. It also, you know, tension can come from a lot of things. It can come from the passage being hard, but it can also come from endurance. Like it can come from reaching that passage after you've already been playing for, you know, two pages of hard stuff. You're tense by the time you get there. So sometimes if it's an endurance thing, I like to have little kind of cues to myself in the music of when I'm going to tune in with that tension and try to release it. Like if there's any easier passages before the hard passage that you can make a mental note, okay, this is when I'm going to clue in with my right hand and my left hand and really try to release that tension. Um, you know, signal to yourself to do that. Learning to undo tension is incredibly difficult. I think for a lot of us, it's like a lifelong battle because tension is not conscious. It's an unconscious thing we do when we're trying. So trying to tap into something unconscious takes time. It takes patience. It means breaking up patterns and breaking up autopilot. So that's why I think going slower really allows you to not be on autopilot and really be thinking about everything. So I think doing slow is kind of the best way to start. Um, then cueing yourself at various points in the music of when you're going to try to release tension. Um, and also evaluating specifically where the tension is because general tension, there's only so much I can say, but like if you know it's left hand, you can work on, you know, if there's something in the left hand in that passage that always makes you tense, you can make little exercises and things to do to work on that so that your hand can do it with more ease and therefore you don't have to be so tense to execute it. So kind of zeroing in on exactly what makes that passage hard and then working really as much as you can to make it not feel so hard might help. If it's bow stuff, if it's like a hard bowing pattern, you can always do it on open strings to kind of master the bow rhythm, but start to really pick it apart because if you're always just playing it through close to in tempo, everything there, you're gonna be tense. You have to break it down if you wanna get rid of that tension.
Um, okay. Is there a way to practice cello concertos? Well, I would say for anything, concertos tend to be our hardest rep, but for anything, you know, that's kind of a broad question, how to practice it, but I would say um, going to your hard passages, similar to what I just said about working on tension, taking the hard passages and breaking them down, turning them in into little exercises, doing them under tempo. Um, I find in a lot of repertoire, there are like two to three spots that are like the spot, the hard spot. And that's where you really want to devote most of your practice attention. And then you can work on more musical things and phrasing in the easier spots. But usually what holds us back from being prepared on a piece are those hard passages. So the sooner you can start working on the hard passages, the better off you're going to be for the whole piece. Um, okay. The ideal weight of a Baroque cello, I couldn't tell you. I don't even know how much my cello weighs. So I have no idea, I'm sorry. Um, okay. Okay, auditioning for music colleges. Uh, tips on controlling nerves during auditions. Oh man, thinking back to my audition days. It's a really special time. Just know it's so stressful, but you're gonna look back on all the adventures you have going to all these schools and doing your auditions. It's like, it's such a great time in musical growth because we practice so hard and you know we're, we're really working towards a concrete goal of getting into a school. So despite how stressed you might be, just know this is a really exciting time for you. Um, what I would say, if you haven't already, um, especially when nerves are in place, the best way to work on playing things um, when you know you're gonna be nervous is just forcing yourself to perform it and put yourself in those pressure situations as much as you can. I imagine you're gonna be playing the same or similar repertoire at all your auditions. So if you can make a little you know, mock program of playing all your audition repertoire and get your family, get your friends, if you have an opportunity at your current school to maybe perform for some classmates, you know, maybe talk to your orchestra teacher. Um, that was one great thing my orchestra teacher did is she let all of us who were taking college auditions perform in front of our orchestra during class just to give us that practice. Um, so I would say make yourself nervous and put yourself in some kind of high pressure or somewhat pressure situations to play your repertoire before your auditions. Get all the nerves out of your system, make all the mistakes you want in front of your friends and family so that by the time you know you go into an audition, you've already done it a couple times, you have a little bit more confidence in yourself, you know that things can go wrong, but you've had to practice dealing with it because a, a big part of making mistakes in auditions, which by the way, we all make mistakes. It's almost impossible to have a perfect audition. It's likely that something's gonna go not quite as great as you wanted. The hardest part isn't making the mistake, it's recovering from the mistake and being able to get back into the groove and still play well, even though you're so distracted by the fact that you just messed something up. So the only way to get better at that is practice having those experiences. So when you're playing for other people, and you make a mistake and you're kind of forced to recover and get back into it, you're gonna to start to develop that skill of surviving in the moment and then you'll be even more equipped when your auditions come. If something is to go wrong, you'll be able to get right back on your feet and still play well. Um, so just practice performing it and, and you know doing the best you can. There's a lot of good books on um, different breathing techniques and things you can do before the audition. If you're someone who gets really shaky nervous, um, definitely work on deep breathing um, that can be something that just helps lower your heart rate and makes you feel a little better. Um, when you're warming up before an audition, don't work yourself up, don't play super fast and go crazy. Go slow, do your warm ups, play things carefully, and really try to just do breaths with counting. So, like, you can do in for five breaths, out for five breaths. Doing a little bit of that for five to ten minutes before an audition can really help if you're elevated and you're, you know, you're feeling kind of crazy. Um, so do that to kind of keep the nerves down, but also you just want to feel confident in yourself. And I think getting that chance to play for other people is really going to help you have that confidence. Okay. Um, okay. Hey, weird guy, I'm going to block you unless someone else did. We need some moderators in the chat. All right. How do I block people? Block. That was easy. <laughs> Thank you all um, for your tolerance of the weirdos in the chat. Okay. Um, any advice for getting used to Baroque tuning and temperament? 
Um, it is hard in the beginning. The more accustomed you are to equal temperament, the harder it is to make the switch. I know a lot of modern players. I run, uh, I help run a workshop called Baroque Cello Boot Camp back in Boston where I used to live. Um, and sometimes we have some really awesome modern players come and have to get into the more Baroque style tuning. And depending on how far along you are in your career and how much you've been playing in equal temperament, which is you know how a piano is tuned, every half step the same size, and that's what we're used to in modern playing, the more used to it you are, uh, the more out of tune and weird, the, the more tempered tuning is going to sound. So I think what helps a lot, if you have it, of course, is playing with an in-tune harpsichord is great um, because you're forced to match a lot of those harpsichord notes. So it puts you in a position where you're constantly adjusting to the temperament. Um, but what might also help is listening to a lot of recordings by period instrument groups because they're, of course, going to be playing in tempered tuning and just getting that sound in your ear, especially if you can listen to 17th century or earlier repertoire, which is going to be more on the mean tune, even more extreme with the temperaments, just start getting that sound in your ear um, because I think it makes it that much easier. I mean, the go-to thing to know is that in general, your sharps are gonna be lower and your flats are gonna be higher in order to create pure thirds. Um, and if you're playing on a string instrument, you can actually play those notes around with your open strings and really listen for when you get a pure sounding interval because you will get more resonance when you lower your major thirds and raise your minor thirds. Um, so it takes a lot of getting used to, but I think a combination of listening and then playing with other people, if possible, who have experience playing the temperament and forcing you to adjust to them um, can also help too. Okay. Um, you guys are awesome, by the way. I'm like super glad you guys are all here with these questions. That's great. Um, okay, Serena asks, how long before a, for a performance do you normally start working on a piece? So this totally depends on what that piece is. If I get a gig to play continuo or accompaniment for someone or just like kind of orchestral part, something that's not too crazy, um, at least at the stage I'm at now, I'll look at it two weeks before it's, if it's not a hard part, something I'm very used to. Um, but let's say it's a solo piece. Um, I think it's great to have six months um, to really learn a piece and really, really get into it, especially if it's something demanding that's kind of a little bit pushing your technique to a new level. It's great to have six solid months of good practicing to really, really work on it. But, you know, life can be unpredictable. Sometimes we get an opportunity or we find out we're going to perform a piece three months away. And if we practice like crazy, we can make that work. Sometimes we find out a year in advance that we're going to have an audition and we have a year to pre you know, prepare for something, and that's great. Um, so I would say for a hard piece that's really going to push me, I'd love to have four to six months to prepare for that. Um, but with practice, you can make a lot of things happen, especially once you know I've already gone through my bachelor's and my master's, so I've gone through a lot of experiences of preparing pieces, and I think as you transition to be a professional, it gets easier and easier to prepare things because you sort of learn your own rhythms and you learn um, you know, what kind of helps you learn things quicker. But I think when you're more in the beginning stages, you have to figure that out as you go. So you need more time to work on a piece to learn which ways are most effective for you to practice, which things are hardest for you. So it really depends also where you are in your musical journey, how long something will take for you to prepare it. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. My biggest struggles are slurs and keeping my bow straight. Any tips to help? So for a straight bow, practice in front of a full length mirror if you have one at home. Um, because we can't see our bow angle from up here, you know, when we're playing. We can't really tell if our bow is straight or not. Um, so when we sit down on our chair in front of a full length mirror, then we can actually see, just like if you're looking at your teacher or you're looking at another cellist, it's much easier to see if the bow is straight. So for one, practice in front of a mirror if you haven't yet, because that will just show you everything you need. It's so hard to fix your bow being straight when we can't really see it from our vantage point. So mirror practicing is huge for being straight. And I think most of us also um, have a tendency of how we, if we tend to play tip down or tip up um, when our bow is not straight. For me, I played tip up a lot. So it was helpful for me to just remember, especially on A string, 
lower the tip, lower the tip, lower the tip, because I knew what my tendency was for playing not straight to the bridge. Um, so know your tendency, try mirror practicing. Um, for slurs, I would say, um, for bowing stuff, I love practicing on open strings. Um, if slurs are the issue on the same string, um, it may be just actually timing of the left and right hand, in which case just slowing down the tempo will help. If the slurs are an issue with string crossings, actually slurring across two different strings, um, I really recommend doing that on open strings. Like take the left hand out of whatever passage you're struggling with and work on doing your slurred string crossings just on open strings. It's very illuminating to do that because then you'll hear, oh wow, I'm way louder on this string or oh, I'm making a whole bunch of effort. In general, I don't know if what you're asking about is string crossings, but if it was string crossings, um, they typically, we tend to overdo string crossings and actually move too much when the strings are really much closer. So um, a lot of times I find with my students, especially if they're struggling with string crossings and slurred string crossings, that actually making the motion smaller and a little bit more controlled helps with that. Um, but I would say mirror is a great start, at least for the straight bow. Okay. I wonder if I can make this chat bigger. You guys are asking so many questions, which is great. Um, okay, yes, wow, look at all these spam people we're getting. Yeah, you know what, I, I wonder if there's a way to have moderators in the chat, because I can, as I go through, block people and mute people, but it's great to have other people there um, to help with that. Okay. Let's see. Oh, Harnacourt's Music as Speech, which I had to read in grad school. Uh, what books of this type do you like? Um, so you're basically asking about historical treatises. Um, and for those who don't know, if you dive into early music and historical performance practice, a lot of what we use for learning about how to play in this style are actual historical books and method books from the time period, the 17th and 18th century. Um, so uh, music as speech is, is a more you know, modern book about that, but I'm, you know, re it references and uses a lot of information from historical treatises. Quantz uh, wrote on playing the flute, and that was not just about playing the flute. It was about a lot of different things. He actually has a great part on um, continual playing. So I would recommend Quantz's treatise. It might be on imslp.org. If you guys don't know about IMSLP, uh, it's a great resource for especially early in Baroque music, but a lot of classical music. It's just got PDF downloads of everything that's public domain. So it's totally worth checking out. I think might even have Quantz on playing the flute. That's Q-U-A-N-T-Z. Um, and let's see, I'm trying to think of some others. Um, you know, so many people ask me about treatises, and I feel like I might have made a video about it a while ago, but maybe I should do another one just kind of covering some of the overviews. Um, there's also, um, Corelli wrote a lot of great stuff for violin. I don't know what instrument you play, but Corelli, especially on ornamentation, um, is a really great resource. But in terms of like modern books about Baroque style, Judy Tarling um, wrote a lot of great books. She's a great resource um, for all historical performance, Baroque playing. Um, so look into Judy Tarling's books as well. Um, this is a live stream. Obviously, as I am asked, I'm answering questions. <laughs> okay. Is something wrong with my microphone? Are you guys hearing me okay? Let me know if anything sounds funny or too quiet or too loud because I can adjust things. I know I'm a little bit uh, behind I'm trying to keep up with all the questions. Um, the biggest, okay, so Richard asks, I played modern cello for 10 years. Three weeks ago, I started on Baroque cello. What are the biggest dangers when you start playing without lessons? Um, and so I assume you mean the dangers of playing Baroque cello without lessons. And I would say the biggest dangers is that you're gonna bring all your modern habits to the Baroque instrument. The biggest one being vibrato. Just turn it off, just turn off the vibrato switch. You don't need it. Um, we're so, especially modern players, we're just compulsory, is that a word? about vibrato. We don't even think about it. It just starts happening. So that's the biggest thing to work on because I think for a lot of players, vibrato, we start doing the second we don't like the sound of a note or a little bit out of tune, the vibrato gets going to cover it up to just take that away. Um, listen to your out of tune notes if you have to, but really make yourself play without vibrato if you're someone who tends to start really get, getting going with the vibrato easily. Um, so that would be the first thing is just learn how to quiet down your left hand. 
Um, then from there, I would say you're going to be getting used to the feeling of gut strings, which is definitely a different experience than steel strings. I do have a video on my channel about playing on gut strings, so you should check that out if you haven't seen it. I'll just give you some ideas of what you're working with. But the biggest thing is bow speed. The gut strings really need a slow, deep, the bow stroke should be shaped like this. You want to get into the string. Whereas on steel strings, we can just skate across the top of them and they just ring right away. The gut string needs a little more love. So you can't use a fast bow speed on a gut string or it's just going to whistle. It's not going to be happy. So work on your more deep, slower bow speed um, and quieting the left hand. And I think those are the biggest things. Um, in terms of how to play in the style, again, I've got a bunch of video videos on my channel about it. Um, and there's so many things to talk about, but technique wise, I think those are the two biggest things. Slow down the bow speed, quiet down the left hand. Um, okay. Okay, do you listen to much modern rep? And if so, what is your favorite modern piece? Um, wait, what is wrong with the microphone? Sorry, I'm distracted. Um, I mean, I'm guessing you guys are hearing me, but uh, do let me know. Is it too quiet? I'm actually going to raise the volume a little bit. Um, okay, let, if you can tell me specifically what sounds wrong with the mic, just let me know and I'll fix it or try to fix it. Okay, back to the modern rep question. Um, I don't, let's see. Recently, since I moved to LA, I have the classical radio station in my car. So I've been like kind of hearing random classical pieces when I'm driving around. And of course I hear modern rep and get excited about certain pieces. Um, I think probably some of my favorite, favorite ones are both the Dvorak and the Elgar Serenade for Strings. Um, I actually played both of those pieces in my high school chamber orchestra and it was like such a dream. I just loved playing them. Um, and you know, Dvorak is honestly still one of my favorite composers. Um, I really like composers that are influenced by folk music, you know, of the more modern classical. So I love Shostakovich also. Um, some of the symphonies are a bit too much. I, if you can't tell from the type of repertoire that I play, I don't really like things that are big and loud very often. Um, so some like Shostakovich symphonies and stuff are like a little too heavy, but I love Shostakovich string quartets, um, Dvorak string quartets too. I would say Shostakovich and Dvorak are, are up there in my, in my top. Um, but I like some French Impressionistic music too. Um, you know, I definitely still like modern, modern pieces. Um, I don't play them as much and my playing style has been so baroque for so many years now that I don't get a chance to play that modern repertoire as much, um, but I still really do enjoy it. Oh, it makes a popcorn sound, huh? Let's see. Oh, okay, I guess it was a little quiet. I'm gonna turn it up a little more. Okay, hopefully things are sounding a little better. Um. Let's see. Okay. What advice do you have for balancing practicing and music with regular life, social life, and such? Yeah, balance is one of the hardest parts of being a musician, that's for sure. Um, I would say, and Serena, this is similar to the answer that I already gave you, which is it's about scheduling. If you can schedule stuff and block out time for when you're going to do things, it just makes more time for everything. So if you're constantly stressed about practicing or feeling like you need to practice, you'll probably never be able to like relax or just have fun because you'll be worried about practicing. But if you put practicing in your schedule and you say, I'm going to practice at this time, maybe it's, you know, also a time where other people are busy or, you know, you know ideally maybe not Friday or Saturday night when you want to hang out with your friends or whatever, um, schedule your practicing in get it done, and then you can go enjoy your social life and you know feel like you got it taken care of. Um, so scheduling, I mean, for me, especially now, I'm a freelance musician, I do five million different things per day. Um, everything is in my calendar. I live by my calendar. When I was in school, I lived by my little uh, paper, back in the days when everyone used paper, everything. Maybe people at school still use like paper planners, but now I have everything you know, in my calendar on my computer, but um, I was always, always scheduling every single thing, and it was the only way to get it done. 
and still have a fun life sometimes. So that would be my recommendation is just deciding how much you want to practice, putting it in your calendar, and then knowing, okay, it's taken care of. You don't have to worry about it all the time. Um, okay. Um, so my Baroque cello um, was built a modern cello and um, it was converted before I owned it. It's actually not 100% in Baroque setup. I mean, I've got a Baroque fingerboard, bridge, tailpiece, um, gut strings, obviously. But I think that the neck is still a little bit not quite 100% what a Baroque neck would be. Little things about it are not totally to Baroque specifications because it was built a modern instrument. It's German, uh, built in about 1950. Um, but if you are in the market for a Baroque cello, um, let me look up what that is. So Itchin Violins, I-F-S-C-H-I-N. Is that how you spell it? I'm going to look that up right now. Um, they have a location here in California and San Francisco. No, there's no C. I-F-S-H-I-N. Um, they carry the J. Haida instruments, um, which make uh, very affordable. I believe they're Chinese-made. Um, but they make Baroque model instruments. They build them new in Baroque setup, and they're very affordable and decent instruments for people who are starting out. So I tend to um, push people towards J. Haida if they're looking to buy a Baroque instrument and they don't have one you know, locally available to them. I think like the cellos, let's see, they range in maybe between two and $3,000. Some of them maybe even 1,800, is that possible? No, probably between two and 3,000, which isn't bad, for a sort of intermediate instrument. Um, and then they're fully in Baroque setup, which is great. So if you're looking, that's typically what I recommend to people. Um, my first instrument. So my very, very first cello, at least that reached full size, was like one of those shiny uh, rental you know, kid instruments. Because like I said, I wasn't taking private lessons until high school. So when I got my full size cello in, who knows, seventh or eighth grade, I still wasn't serious. I was just renting through, you know, whatever company the school used. Um, so I just had kind of a not so great cello. I think my mom may still have it somewhere, but my modern cello that I use now, I got still pretty long ago. It was a decent instrument. Um, and I got it as I was getting serious and getting ready for college auditions. So I think I was around 16 when I got my main modern cello that I still use now for teaching lessons. And on the rare occasion that I get a modern gig, I still use that instrument. So that's still kind of like my high school instrument. Goes way back for me. Um, okay. You guys are awesome with all these questions. So maybe I will start doing some playing and then we can get into some more questions uh, if things come up. At this point, I could just sit here and answer your questions all day, but I was gonna play a little bit. Um, so maybe I'll get ready to do that. You guys have any other lingering questions before I start? Go ahead. This is my go to home drink iced tea and lemonade. Oh, okay. Don't worry, I'll um I'll uh put the J Haida instruments. I'm gonna put it in the chat right now. Um, I don't own any other Baroque instruments. Um, my dream, as I make a little more money, get a little more successful maybe, is to own a harpsichord uh, because they are just gorgeous, gorgeous instruments, so many of them, and there's nothing like having a live harpsichord, and that would mean I could also host rehearsals at my house because oftentimes finding a space with a harpsichord can be an issue. So I hope to eventually get a harpsichord someday down the line. But as of now, all I have are my two cellos. Um, Vinny asked about, it's imslp.org, so I'm gonna put that in the chat so that you guys have it. Um, and yes, they have all everything, all classical repertoire spanning a large amount of time. Um, for all instruments. So yeah, definitely check them out. They're a great website. Um, okay. Time to get ready to play a little bit.
might try to put this computer somewhere close to where I'm practicing so that I can see if you guys ask some other stuff. Okay, and as I get the cello set up and get ready to play a little bit, do let me know about volume levels and stuff. I think I'm gonna turn the mic down a little bit since cello is louder than my voice. Okay, what am I going to play today? So, um, I didn't realize I was cutting my head off. I may have an announcement in the coming months. It's not solidified yet, but I am working on some repertoire, some of which is familiar if you guys already know my albums, uh, some which is a little more new. Um, but I'm working on a set of repertoire that I put together for a specific purpose that I would like to eventually announce, but nothing's concrete yet. But I'll probably be practicing some of that today. Um, okay. Have you ever found modern repertoire that you find responds particularly well to a Baroque approach? Um, well, I don't know what you consider modern, if you mean like totally contemporary, um, but I find anything from the classical period, even the later classical period, um, we don't think of that as early music or you know something that we're gonna apply specific performance practice techniques to, but so often when I hear Beethoven or you know some later Schubert, I think of so many performance practice techniques that we use, usually things that are um, kind of more phrasing oriented, like the idea of strong and weak and leaning into dissonances and coming away from consonances. I think, is that a word? Consonances? <laughs> um, but you know what I mean? Leaning into dissonances is a huge part of um, early music and Baroque music because those are the points of tension and the points that we really want to bring out in the music. Um, so sometimes when I'm listening to a modern recording of classical repertoire, I want, you know, more of that. And vibrato, honestly, you know, vibrato was not used all over everything until really the Russian school of the 20th century. So a lot of classical and even early romantic works, I think, work a lot better without vibrato all over everything. Um, vibrato is so beautiful. It should be used in a special mindful way. It shouldn't be all over everything all the time. That's typically my response when I'm hearing more modern recordings. Um, okay, do you always keep your cellos out or do you put them away in their cases to guard them from ambient humidity? Well, now that I live in Los Angeles, uh, weather is not an issue. I guess it's a little dry here. Um, but not, not as dry as the winters were on the East Coast. So my instruments are pretty happy and safe, and I also don't uh, let, let them get direct sunlight. I do get a lot of sun in here, but I make sure there's no direct light on the instruments. Um, and I have a little humidity monitor thing. I'll show it to you guys, actually, because I'm obsessed with it. Um, really simple little thing, but always tells me how humid it is. 47 in here. I think it's also from being inside. I have this little thing. It's an essential oil diffuser, but it does put some humidity into the air. And then of course, like if I shower or anything, there's humidity inside the apartment. So it doesn't get too dry, but it never gets really too humid here in LA. Um, so it's a pretty mild climate. So it's fine for me to leave my instruments out, but if I'm teaching lessons with my modern cello, I'll leave it in the case, you know, if I don't need to take it out at home. Um, I would suggest if you're in a kind of tricky climate, like really, really dry, um, that you put your instrument away in the case with a damp it or some kind of humidifier, um, just because dry climate is really what will kill an instrument. But with how moderate things are here, it's been fine for me to leave my instruments out so long as they don't get sun on them. Um, I wonder if it's the wire for this microphone. I hope not. Um, yeah, I wonder if it's what I have this microphone set on. I'm going to put it on top of something else and see if that helps. Now you can see it. Let's move some of this stuff around. Sorry if this is noisy. The joys of live streaming. I get to do this the moment for everybody to watch. If I can get it out of the shot. Here we go. All right, let's hope that makes the microphone sound extra good. 
Okay. If the instrument is exposed to direct sunlight, it basically, it can do a lot of different things. The main thing that it will do is uh, dry the glue. So actually what happened to me in high school, I was so disturbed. So I had my cello in a stand like this in my bedroom and it was in a spot that got a ton of light and I didn't know anything about instrument maintenance back in those days. So one day I went to get my cello from the spot where it was and I you know, went to touch it and the entire fingerboard just came off just bam, there went the fingerboard. And what had happened over time, all that direct sunlight had dried the glue that was gluing the fingerboard on place, in place. So I was horrified, I think I cried. I was like 16, I, no, I thought I ruined my cello. Luckily, you take it to a luthier, they re-glue it for you, it's not the end of the world. But you don't wanna do that to your instrument. So yeah, sun is very powerful and drying is kind of the worst thing, like I said about dry climate. Drying stuff up is the worst thing you can do to your instrument. The wood dries out, gets all the cracks in the wood open up because they're dry, the glue dries up. You don't want dryness and that's what the sun brings. Um, um, okay. All right, so back to trying to play, unless you guys throw some more questions at me, which is totally fine and great. Okay, and let me find some music to play. So, I don't know if you guys are like this. This is the amount of stuff on my music stand right now. I'm gonna drop it just trying to show you. Can you tell how many, this was all on my music stand. But, you know, we all live that way sometimes. So let's see, I guess I can put this over here while I look at my music. I don't mess anything up. One thing that I wish I had a better solution for was just organizing my music library. Like, I'm sure anyone, especially who's like college level or beyond, understands that just there's so much, you just accumulate so much music and it's hard to keep track of all of it. It's hard to come up with a good system to organize it. Every book is a different shape and size. So, music library problems, I guess. that I had all this on the stand because usually my go-to thing is putting it all over the floor. And that doesn't really make my home very peaceful when I have sheet music all over the floor. So this is my, since I'm going through my music, this is my Haydn Concerto book from when I took my college auditions because this is what I played for my college auditions. Look at how loved this is. <laughs> loved or tortured, I don't know what you would call it. <laughs> all these markings, this poor page. And then what's really cool was in uh, college, I took a course, um, it was actually a performance practice course, but we got to write our own cadenzas. So I wrote my own cadenza for the Haydn C major concerto too. So if I ever play this concerto again, I've got my own cadenza to play. Oh, some Gabrielli, nice. Wow, Barrier, I haven't seen that in a while. That's why it's good to go through your music stand from time to time. Okay, maybe I'll play, who knows. Let's get a bunch of this over here. Okay, I'm gonna swivel this back around. try to have the stand not too much in the shot. So that's a little distracting. Um, okay. Is this all I want to play? What else? Yeah, this is a good start. Okay. Turn the microphone down a bit for the cello.
Okay, so my voice should be quieter. Let me know how the cello volume is when I tune. I might actually move the microphone, um, unless that sounds totally fine to you guys. Yeah, I think I'm gonna move it. Let's see. Okay. All right, so here's the cello. I turned up a bit. We'll see what it's like when I start playing again. Yeah, I'm so afraid of it being too loud because I realized on some of the earlier live streams I did, like maybe a few years ago, I always made the cello too loud and what would happen is it would come through the stream really compressed and sound like it was distorted. But because it sounded distorted, I never knew that the problem was that it was up, turned up too loud. I just thought, why is it distorting? Why is it distorting? And then I finally realized it was just too loud. So now I always try to make sure the cello is low enough so that it doesn't distort. Um, but I want to make sure you guys can hear me and hear the cello comfortably. Oh, hey, Tom. How's it going? Thanks for stopping by. If you guys don't know Tom, he has an awesome YouTube channel. You should definitely check it out. Awesome gamba and broke violin player, and he makes the best mashups and memes of classical music ever, so definitely check out his channel. Um... In terms of practicing late at night, I actually don't practice late at night because I used to be really ignorant about that. I would practice at any time, not thinking about my neighbors, thinking, oh, the cello's not that loud. And then I had this one neighbor who lived below me who one day just exploded on me for all the cello playing that he had to listen to. Um, I also taught lessons sometimes in the apartment. So that guy disturbed me when he like really yelled at me for my cello playing. So then ever since then, I become totally paranoid about one of my neighbors yelling at me, even though that only happened once. And I lived in so many apartments in Boston, like five different apartments. And that only happened to me one time. And lots of people say they love the sound of the cello. They never complain, but I try to be careful about the timing. Um, in my apartment building, people seem to be up fairly late, so I'll practice as late as 9 or 10 o'clock at night, but no time after that. And I'm never up early, so I, I definitely don't practice early in the morning. Okay. All right, so time for some playing. Um, doing the questions has been awesome, you guys. I so appreciate that you guys have so many questions to ask. Um, if you're liking this stream, just have to do a little ad. As you can see down there, I'm taking donations on the GoFundMe. Just any like little tip, anything you want to do if you're enjoying the stream and you find it useful. You could also consider pledging to my Patreon, which are people that support my YouTube channel every time I put out a new video, which is uh, roughly three or four a month. Um, so I super uh, appreciate my Patreon patrons because they are really what allow me to make regular YouTube videos. Um, so if you're super into my channel, joining Patreon is a great way to get involved. Um, if you just want to give a tip or a donation just for today's stream, you can do that at the GoFundMe. Or you can just continue watching for free. It's fine too. Um, okay, let's play a little bit. Maybe I need some rosin though. Let me find my rosin. I use, if you're curious, I use Kaplan dark rosin, really basic. It used to be $5. 
think they raised the price. It might be seven or eight now. But super basic rosin, but I love it for gut strings. Gets the job done. Doesn't have to be a fancy, fancy rosin. Um, and yeah, if you're curious about any of my gear and stuff that I use, I have a little Amazon shop because that's like a new thing you can do is um, influencers can have stores on Amazon. So I have an Amazon store that has a lot of my little supplies and things that I use, my gear, um, also the modern steel strings that I use when I play modern cello because my the guy who makes my gut strings is not on Amazon. But anyway, the link should be in the description of the video if you're curious about any of my other equipment. Okay, so I think I'm gonna start with the Gabrielli first Richard Carr. Super popular Baroque cello piece. Not popular by uh, regular standards, but popular by Baroque cello standards. Um, I performed and recorded this piece a bunch. I love it. Um, and I recommend it to my students who are new to Baroque cello because it is just like baseline heaven. Um, if you don't know about Gabrielli, he was a cellist in the 17th century and he wrote these richer cars. A richer car is basically an unaccompanied piece, usually kind of exploratory in nature, almost like a prelude. Um, so Gabrielli wrote how many of these now? Seven? Eight? Can't believe I don't remember. He wrote a few richer cars for solo cello um, and they're really great pieces. There are modern prints. I use the facsimile, which looks like this. It is legible, but, uh, you know, if you're not, why can't I make this straight? If you're not used to reading off music like this, it's a bit challenging, but you get used to it. And the other thing I just want to say about Gabrielli before I play this is that um, it's thought that Gabrielli was working with an alternate tuning for the cello where the top A string was actually tuned down to a G. Um, and we see that because that was a popular tuning uh, around Gabrielli's city and his time, and um, also some of the writing in the Richard Cars sort of seems like it would work better with a G on the top instead of an A. Um, so times when I've performed Gabrielli, I have done it with the, tu the alternate tuning. We don't consider it scordatura. Scordatura is when a composer deliberately asks you to retune the strings to some special thing. That was really common with Bieber, um, who wrote a bunch of really great violin sonatas, often using a scordatura tuning. But these, it was not considered scordatura because it wasn't an intentional special effect thing. That was actually their normal tuning during Gabrielli's time. But I'm going to be playing on standard tuning. They work fine in standard tuning also. Okay. time playing today. I haven't even warmed up, but you can play Gabrielli under any conditions. Kind of. 
me find that other page. I actually made, I forgot that I made a version where I printed it all on one page, so that's what I thought this was. But no, it was only the first page. Do you guys know this piece? You should totally play it if you don't. There's a million ways to play it, so many ways to interpret it. Just a great Baroque cello piece overall. Yeah, I was actually surprised that I even found the first page, so this makes sense why I have no idea where the second page is. Wow, well, won't that be depressing if I don't even finish that Gabrielli Richard Carr? Oh, well, I'm not going to dig through my stacks. I'll just play something else. Hi, Sydney. Thanks for joining. Thank you guys so much for being here. Let's get back to something where I have all the pages. Um, if you've tuned in somewhat recently, we did a bunch of q and I'm still taking questions as they come in, so feel free to ask anything about cello, music, music career, life, any of that stuff. And in the meantime, I'm just casually playing some unaccompanied stuff. I was playing some... Uh, <laughs> I was playing some Gabrielli until I realized I did not have all the pages. So, let's get into something else. Maybe I'll play some Dots Hour. Fast forward a couple hundred years, and we end up with Dots Hour Etudes. So, I'll play a little one of these, and then I'll see what else I want to do because uh, I actually did not even think we would last so long on questions. I was only gonna live stream for an hour and then we did questions for almost an hour. So I'm playing a little bit now, but I kind of also feel like don't really need to play, you can just keep doing questions. But anyway, let's get some dot sour in our lives. This is etude number six. So this is getting into the earlier classical period. <laughs> because I didn't warm up at all today. <laughs> my hands are very annoyed at me for throwing myself directly into that. So, in an ideal world, I would have warmed up. But that's okay. Um, how ha 
has my warm-up routine evolved over the years? Do I still play classic major scales? I definitely, I've done a couple of videos actually and a few live streams where I talk about my warm-up routine and some of the things that I like to do. Um, scales are always a huge part of it. I love doing scales for warm-ups. What I usually do is I take a scale and I do various different kinds of bowing patterns and I'll go around the scales, um, usually in circle of fifths. I won't go through all the keys. I'll go up to about three or four sharps and flats, um, but I'll work through in the uh, circle of fifths with different bowing patterns for each scale, or sometimes I'll just pick the scale of the whatever p main piece I'm working on and do a couple exercises with that scale. Um, but I always try to, in an ideal world, when I'm preparing for a recital or a recording, um, I'll do scales for half an hour to 45 minutes, just scales warming up before I do a real practice session. Um, okay, what else can I play? And I might still wrap up the stream kind of soon because like I said, I was only gonna do an hour, so we're a little over now, but I'll keep playing and you guys can keep sort of asking questions as they come to you. Probably go another five or 10 minutes. You know what's a good piece to work on and talk about? Um, so Dallabacco, if you're not familiar, wrote some great capricci for solo cello. These are around box time, so uh, 18th century. And the first one in particular, which is in C minor, has a lot of good technical challenges. One, playing in the key of C minor, and then fourth finger trills. So I might play through this kind of slowly and actually sort of sh work on the trills a little bit for in front of you guys. Um, have you ever had any experience with viola da gamba or other early bow instruments like the VL? So I have played gamba. I love the gamba. Um, I love it so much, sometimes I think I shouldn't get serious about it because I just want it to remain a magical thing in my mind, whereas if I play it more seriously, it'll become more of a stressor. Um, but I love the viola da gamba. I had to play it in grad school and I learned a little bit at summer workshops. Um, so probably the most advanced I got was doing uh, like f English Fantasia suites, things for, you know, three to five different gamba players. Um, I can play continuo on the gamba fairly well. Um, but I didn't do a ton of solo repertoire on the gamba. I was not good at alto clef and the combination of playing a new instrument and clef reading really overwhelmed me, especially while I was in school dealing with so many other things. Um, so I never really got, I never mastered the gamba, but I did learn how to play it on kind of a simple basic level and I really do enjoy it. I don't have an instrument right now, so I can't play, but I have thought about getting a rental or getting my hands on a gamba here in LA so that I could play it a little bit more because I would really like that. Okay. All right, I'm going to play a little bit of this Dalabaco, kind of under tempo, sort of practice tempo.
so there's a lot of tempos for this. You know, that was definitely a practice tempo, but I actually like this movement on the slower side because you can kind of luxuriate in it more. Um, there's so many expressive liberties that you can take, but especially for starting out practicing it like I am right now, it really helps to play it as evenly as possible. And if you didn't notice, so many fourth finger trills. I think in Baroque repertoire especially, this is one of the most movements with the most fourth finger trills that I've ever encountered. Um, and for those who don't know, trilling with the fourth finger takes some finesse and it gets, you know, it gets fatigued easily because that's not a strong finger. So when you have a piece like this with so many fourth finger trills, um, it's really hard to keep it relaxed, especially as the movement goes on. So that's definitely a big practice point for me, um, you know, when I'm doing this, when I'm working on this piece. Um, yeah, it's beautiful, right? So if you don't know, if you didn't catch it before, this is Dalabaco. And this was his first Capriccio for solo cello. I have recorded it on my album, Bass Sounds Evolved, which you can get on Spotify, iTunes, everywhere. Um, I recorded it there, and that was like years ago at this point, almost three years ago I did that recording. Um, so I'm considering doing an updated one, maybe. Um, but for now, if you're looking for a recording of that piece, I do have it on Bass Sounds Evolved, which you can find. Again, searching Emily Davidson or Bass Sounds Evolved um, on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you listen to your music. Um, okay. Thank you for the welcome to California. I love it here, if that's not apparent. Okay, so I think I'm actually gonna wrap up the stream pretty soon. Um, so if you have any lingering questions, throw them at me now, ASAP, and I will get to them, put my cello away. Thank you guys seriously so much. I know my head is cut off, I'm gonna fix that. Get my stuff over here. Thank you guys so much for tuning in today and for asking questions. You know, if you can't tell already, I obviously, uh, I haven't been planning these streams very far in advance. I kind of just, oh, my computer's shaky. I kind of just decide spontaneously when I am going to live stream. So it really means a lot that you guys just kind of jump on it right away and join me. Um, and then, of course, the stream is archived so you can watch it later. So if you're watching it later, thank you for doing that. Um, it's really, really fun for me to do these streams. I love it, especially getting to interact with you guys because if you don't know, you know, I film videos on my YouTube channel every week pretty much, but I'm doing them by myself and obviously they're, they're finished videos. So the only way I really get to interact with you guys is through the comments. But on these live streams, I actually get to talk to you guys and take your questions. It's so much more fun for me. Um, neighbors outside making noise. Um, so, uh, wow. Give me a second. Okay, I'm back. All right. So what else can I tell you guys for the end of the stream? Um, anything exciting coming up? Well, like I said, I may have a big announcement in the next month or two, uh, maybe end of December, early January. I may have some news uh, about what I'm up to next, but I'm always doing my YouTube videos. Uh, I, I say I do one every week, but my schedule varies, but always three or four a month, again, supported by my patrons on Patreon, which makes such a big difference and allows me to make these videos all the time. Uh, the patrons also support the live streams. So if you're a patron on Patreon, thank you guys so much. You totally make it possible for me to do this stuff. Um, and if you want to get involved, Patreon is a great way to do it. Um, okay. All right. What would you say is enough for a day's practice? What's the limit, maybe a physical one that people should look out for? Um, what I would say, depends on your instrument for one, pianists can practice like 10 hours a day. I mean, I'm not a pianist, I'm not advising that, but um, depending on your instrument, your endurance is, is gonna fall within that range. I think trumpet players and singers know that they can't sing for like, I don't know what their cap is, maybe three hours max. Like, 
you really are not supposed to be able to keep pushing yourself past that point. String players are somewhere in the middle of how long you can play. I mean, string players can really play for hours, but you don't want to get repetitive stress injuries. Um, so I did answer a question about practicing in the earlier part of the stream. I think if you have, you know, you're still improving and working on your technique, you maybe have um, recitals, performances, like you're in a preparation mode, not just a maintenance mode. I think three hours a day is a really good goal. That doesn't have to be seven days a week. That can be five days a week, six days a week. Um, I think three hours is a great goal for when you have, um, you know, real things you're working towards. I think if you're not doing anything, I don't think you need to practice three hours a day. But if you're working on stuff, three hours is great. You can really devote a good 30 to 45 minutes to just warm ups and really kind of getting yourself going. Because if you're going to practice for a long time, it is critical that you do a good solid warm up. That's just going to set you up to practice well for the rest of your session. So don't skip your warm ups for one. Um, and then, uh, Beyond that, the three hour mark I think is good for getting stuff done. You could practice a variety of things. There's enough time to work on more than one movement, um, but not enough to drive yourself crazy. But break it up. Always take breaks. Be sure to stretch out when you can. Um, everyone's different with where they can get like a physical issue. I mean, I know I got a lot of shoulder and neck pain when I was practicing too hard and too much. Um, and probably the most useful thing that I learned about that is taking breaks and stretching. Um, you know, if you don't know some basic stretches for your shoulders and arms and back, learn some because if you play a string instrument, those are the muscles you're using all the time. So being sure that you're stretching things out um, is really going to help make sure that your practice session doesn't actually physically harm you. Um, so stretching is the key, I think, to longer in periods of endurance. But yeah, I think the magic three hour amount is really good um, when you're preparing for stuff. Um, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Dana, for watching. Um, all right, you guys. So I'm going to wrap it up for today. Thanks again for tuning in. I try to do these live streams once a month if I can. Um, I'm assuming you're all subscribed to my YouTube channel by this point, um, all you guys who are tuning in. But if for some reason you are not subscribed, definitely hit the subscribe button because YouTube is supposed to email you when I go live. So that way you'll know right away if I'm doing a live stream, if you don't catch like a post on Facebook or Instagram. Um, so be sure you're subscribed. And... I'm going to do these more. So if you have questions lingering, I will get to them in the next Q&A. So thanks for watching, you guys. I will see you next time. Bye.